everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. So it's been a few weeks since I've made a news video and man oh man are there some serious updates to go over here. In the past week there have been a number of major information drops from locations to casting calls to casting choices to episode titles and then ultimately some clues to how this all may play out in the adaptation. Now in this video I'm going to run through the news starting with some of the more minor stuff and ending with the casting and episode titles. And then I'm going to take a few minutes and give you some analysis on what I think this might mean for the Wheel of Time adaptation and answer some tough questions about what type of adaptation we might get. The sponsor for today's video is Audible.com. Audible is the world's largest depository of audiobooks and they've been a sponsor of my channel from almost the get-go. They are giving my viewers a very special deal. If you've never checked out audiobooks, you're going to be able to get two of them for free. Just head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nabless and sign up for the trial. You're going to get the two books and you really support the channel by doing so. Thank you to everybody who has. Today's video is going to carry a spoiler rating of red with spoilers all the way through the Great Hunt, but I will be making some references to New Spring. Hopefully not spoiling anything, but definitely some references. If you've not finished the second book of the series at least, please watch this video at your own risk. So let's kick off the news with some of the more minor stuff that may have bigger ramifications than you might think. Let's start with some leaked images that have not been confirmed, but appear to be very credible. On screen right now is a leaked image that appears to be a Tinker Wagon and Tinker Woman in all of her colorful garb. Again, this isn't confirmed, but the picture does appear to portray Tinkers, and that does seem to reflect descriptions of the Tinkers. So if this is a tinker, what does that mean for the adaptation? Well, I had previously thought that cutting the tinker scenes in the eye of the world was a possibility, just to save some time or reallocate that time elsewhere. If this is a tinker and the tinkers are indeed going to be a part of the show, that means we can leave the idea of cutting the tinkers alone. I'll talk more about this at the end of the video, but I think it means that the tinker scenes with Egwene and Perrin are likely to be in the adaptation. Another leaked picture is what appears to be a set for a small town. Again, this isn't confirmed, but it comes uh, from the Wheel of Time filming locations. As you can see from the pictures, there's a good amount of detail being put into these sets. There's been a bunch of speculation that this is the set for Emmons Field. I don't know that I'm entirely sure of that. Uh, the village appears to be more of a rundown flyspeck village than a prosperous yet small village on the edge of civilization. I can say that as much as I like this design, I hope this isn't Emmons Field. As I think Emmons Field is a bit more prosperous looking than this. I guess it's just my headcanon, but it's also possible that this just isn't finished or there's going to be additional CGI with the shot, so we'll have to wait and find out. Our next piece of news here really isn't news, but it's a release from Wheel of Time showrunner Rafe Judkins on the 30th anniversary of the release of Eye of the World. He released a picture to his Instagram that you can see on the screen right now of Josh Stradowski, the actor that was cast as Randall Thor. He's receiving some makeup in a very beautiful looking setting here in the mountains. Not a whole lot to see, but you can see a little bit of the costuming and the pants and boots. It looks fairly sleek. There isn't a ton that can be gleaned from the photo though, but a couple things of note I could find. First of all, this is a mountainous terrain. So I would assume that this is the Mountains of Mist based on what we know about the sequences that have been filmed so far, but it very well could be Shinar or the Mountains of Doom or even Rand at Tarwin's Gap. Secondly, it's striking to me how much Jasha now fits the descriptions of Rand. Uh, I'm really excited to see his performance. To me, he looks exactly like I would picture Rand. So our last piece of minor news is a number of casting calls that have gone out for Project Project W, which is the code for the Amazon production of The Wheel of Time. The first of these casting calls is for a puppeteer, which seems to be a strange ask for The Wheel of Time show. I've seen some speculating that this would be for the puppet show in Kyrian in The Great Hunt, but I think it's actually more likely for visual effects. Most practical effects use puppeteers when they have animatronic monsters or creatures. I think that this is a sign that they are building animatronic shadow spawn, and that's something that I'm very excited about, if that is indeed what they're doing. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the realistic look of practical effects, so I'm really hoping that they take this route rather than like all CGI. The second casting call is for five women that would be needed as extras for a steam room scene that will require nudity. To me, this is fairly clear that they're looking for women for the baths in Shinar. I'll explain a little bit more about this at the end of the video, but that's an oddly specific request, and given that this is long before the Aiel enter the equation, I think it's safe to say that it's Shinar. I will be announcing to you all that I'm going to throw my hat in the ring for one of these roles. The last casting call is another odd one. Uh, this is a request for a male barber without any tattoos. This is a super odd request, and I, as I really can't think of an instance where a barber is used in the story. My only thought is that there's a scene that they're going to be filming that requires an on-screen shave with a straight razor, and they wanted to bring on an expert or somebody that does that. So with that out of the way, let's hit the major news. Um, so let's hit the casting news to start. The first piece of casting news is a bit older. It was announced a few weeks back, but that's that Priyanka Bose has been cast in the role of Alana Mosvan. 
Amani, an Aes Sedai of the Green Aja. Also announced with her was Emmanuel Amani as her warder Yvonne, and Taylor Napier as her other warder Maxime. Priyanka Bose is an Indian actress and model that's best known for her work in a number of Indian television productions. I wasn't really able to watch too much of her work as most of it is in Hindi, but she does have some English language work, and although I wasn't able to get a hold of any of it. From the interactions with fans I've seen so far, she seems really, really excited about the role, and at least on the surface level, she looks like I would picture Alana. Emmanuel Amani is a Nigerian-born but South London-raised actor that has very few credits to his name. I couldn't find much about his past roles, but he does seem fine to play a warder, as far as I can see. Now, Taylor Napier is an American actor and writer that doesn't have many roles to his name, but he has appeared in a number of shows. So he appeared in the HBO show True Blood in a very small role, and has held various smaller roles in short films and short television stints over the past few years. He should do fine as one of Alana's warders. He does have one other super important connection that I feel like is probably worth note, and that is that he is the partner for Rafe Judkins, the showrunner for The Wheel of Time. In terms of what casting Alana and her warders at this stage means for the adaptation, I'm going to address that at the end of the video, so stay tuned on that. The next casting announcement comes in the form of Claire Perkins being cast in the role of Kareen Nagashi. Kareen is a green sister that is renowned for her strength in the One Power, and she made appearances in the New Spring novel. She was one of the sisters that the Amarlin Seat sent looking for the Dragon Reborn after Guitara Moroso fell dead after her foretelling. Kareen was the Captain General of the Green Aja, which means that she was the head of the Greens. She supposedly drowned after falling from a boat, but it is believed that her death was due to the Black Aja. So this is obviously an interesting casting, not only for the actress they chose to play her, but more so that she was included at all. This does give us some clues as to the direction of the show, but more on that at the end of the video. So what do we know about Claire Perkins? Well, Claire is a very experienced actress with a lot of work in theater, film, and television. She's had roles on EastEnders, Doctors, The Crown, and a number of other productions on the BBC. We obviously don't know much about Kareen's character, so it's really hard to make a judgment as whether she'd fit that role or not, but based on her acting chops and her history, I'd say she's going to do great in the role. The next role that we have a confirmed actress for is Kate Fleetwood in the role of Leandrin. Leandrin is a red Aja sister that shows up in Faldara. She is a red, but we later find out she's a part of the Black Aja. Now, Kate Fleetwood is an English actress that's known for roles on the stage, on television, and in movies. She's had roles in a few big movies like Les Mis, Star Wars Episode 7, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, and probably the work that she's most known for is her work on the stage. She was nominated for a Tony Award for her work in the play Macbeth, along with Patrick Stewart. I have a link to her performance in the description of the video. She's a great actress. And although she doesn't have rosebud lips, uh, I don't think that they that means that they can't give her some. She does have the harshness that you might expect from Leandrin, and I think she looks like a great hire to me. We also have a number of other actors and actresses that have not been confirmed to have roles, but we do know that they're in the show. So that opens up a lot of things to speculation. Uh, first, we have Maria Doyle Kennedy in an unknown role. Given that it's a completely unknown role and really just speculation at this point, I'd say she gives off a Varen vibe uh, when I've watched interviews with her. Others I've seen suggest Elida, but I don't really get that feel from her man. Aneurysms. She just isn't harsh in a way that I would expect Elida to be harsh, just in the way she talks or smiles. Obviously, this is just a guess for me, but based on the information that we do have and based on everything I've seen of her, uh, I think Maria Doyle Kennedy will be Varen, uh, and I think that's as good a choice as any. The next of the performers that we know are involved, but we don't have a confirmed role for, is Jennifer Garcia. She's a Canadian-born actress and model who's had roles in Van Helsing, The Colony, and The 100. All we know about the role that she's playing is that she will be playing an undisclosed Aes Sedai. Again, pure speculation on my part, but I'd guess that she's playing Liana. I've heard a lot of people saying that she could be Swan, but after watching her act and seeing some clips of her, and again, I just don't feel like she's got Swan's abrasiveness, and, and her smile is just way too genuine. Again, it's possible that she's Swan, but my money would be on Liana. Now, some weeks back, it was leaked that Daryl McCormick from Peaky Blinders would be playing an undisclosed role for three episodes in the first season of Wheel of Time. This was never confirmed, and while we still don't know who he's playing, it was confirmed this week that he will have some role in the story and that he was present at the table read for episode 5 and 6. So we still don't know who he's playing, but I had originally speculated that he might be playing a White Cloak, but I no longer think that's the case. If he's in these later episodes, he's either going to be a Shinaran like Ingtar, or most likely to be Huron. It's possible that he could be somebody else, but then again, I am just speculating. Hopefully we're going to get some more confirmation soon. And lastly, at the same table read, they dropped a bombshell without calling any attention to it. Without giving his name, they dropped a picture of one of the most popular Finnish actors of all time and the current star of the popular Vikings TV show, Peter Franzen. Now, I love this guy's voice. He's gritty, he's tough looking, and he's a really good actor. We again have no idea who he's playing in the show, 
And they didn't give his name even, but they just showed his picture, which is crazy to me because he's probably the biggest name of all of the people they dropped. But it's very clearly him. And this has me really excited as to who he could be playing. Again, purely speculation, but I am really hoping that he's going to be a Shamael. Go listen to his voice. I'll have a clip in the description below. Love listening to him talk. And if you've watched Vikings, he's legit. This is a big hire. Now, the last piece of news that we have is probably the biggest, in my opinion. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the video and try to tie together all of the other news that we just got. So the actors and actresses held up pictures with their copy of the script from the table read they just did, indicating that episode five will be titled Blood Calls Blood. Now for a quick recap, we already have episode titles for episodes one through four and an unconfirmed but pretty obvious title for episode six based that we could see it like behind another sheet of paper. So it was there and so we pretty much know what episode six's title is as well. In case you aren't familiar, those episode titles are as follows. Episode one, Leave Taking. Episode two, Shadows Waiting. Episode three, A Place of Safety. Episode four, The Dragon Reborn. And now we have episode five as Blood Calls Blood and the following episode six as The Flame of Tarvalin. We also have leaked information that tells us that the first season is likely to be eight episodes long. Well, there's a lot of information to be pulled from this and let's start with the obvious. Blood Calls Blood is a reference to the dark prophecy scrawled on the walls of the Faldara dungeon after the escape of Padon Fane and the Great Hunt. It's long been surmised that the episode titles were telling us that they might be adapting the first two books in the first season. Some myself included, really thought that these titles were just simply red herrings meant to keep us guessing, and that they really weren't to be trusted in the sense that they were copying the chapter titles from the books. I, I really wasn't sure where they were going with the writing. But now we've got a clear reference to a scene that takes place in The Great Hunt, happening in episode five of the first season, and I believe that helps put the idea that these titles are red herrings to red. You combine that with the fact that many Aes Sedai, including main characters like Leandrin and Alana from The Great Hunt, have been cast, and actresses that appear in new, the New Spring story uh, also have been cast, and it seems like Eye of the World will be wrapped up for the most part in episode four, or close to it, and that seems to be the most likely explanation for the casting in episode titles. I don't know about you, but my initial reaction to this is far from positive. Uh, frankly, I was a bit upset the other day thinking about it. And here's my basic beef with it. Condensing the story of Eye of the World into four episodes just did not seem possible to me without major cuts to the story and without losing the world building, which is to me the strength of the story. To me, if you can't develop characters and you can't make the viewers care about those characters, then you are setting up a failure. Moving through the content at a super fast pace just does not seem like the way to do that. So here's what I decided to do. I wanted to figure out is adapting the eye of the world as it was written even possible in four episodes. And if it was, how much would they need to cut? In typical me fashion, I decided to do a ton of research. I decided to go back and watch some episodes of a fairly successful book adaptation that shares some similarities with multiple plot lines like The Wheel of Time. I went and I watched four episodes of Game of Thrones and I timed each change of point of view or location. What I was looking for is how far they could advance the plot in character movements and character moments and how short a time based on how long these scenes were. What I was looking for was basically how many times did they switch point of views, how long was the average one and how far did they advance the plot in each episode? And so in my head, I had attributed times that I thought certain scenes would take from the Wheel of Time and what I found surprised me quite a bit. So let me start by giving you some information here. On average, Game of Thrones had 16 changes in point of view for the episodes I watched and the average POV scene was right around two and a half minutes. So basically every time they would jump from place to place, they spent about two and a half minutes in each place. I was absolutely blown away at how much they accomplished in that time. The longest can continuous scene that I found was only eight minutes long and that felt like an eternity on the show. So I took what I learned and the ideas that I had about how long it would be necessary and I went back and I mapped out everything that happens in the eye of the world to see if indeed this could be condensed into four episodes. What I'm about to show you is what I found. Now a few disclaimers before I show you this. This is not what I want them to do or what I think they will do, or what I think is going to happen. This exercise is simply an experiment to see if it would be possible to try to condense the story as I see it into four episodes. I am convinced that it will be vastly different than what I'm presenting here, and likely far, far more polished. This is simply a demonstration of how this could work out. So please do not comment and tell me how bad my adaptation would be, all of that. This is simply taking events from the books and trying to fit them into a period of time. The other thing is I know we're adding in Loghain scenes, and so what I did is I added in a couple different placeholders 
where I felt like they could expand on Loghain's character. So let's start with episode one of the season and of the show, and that's leave taking. Now I wanted to try and fit everything in, and even if I didn't think it would be included, so while I'm not sure that the prologue of the books will make it into the show, I decided to include it here. So my story starts off with the prologue as a cold open. This interaction and the action scene of the creation of Dragon Mount I allowed about six minutes for, which I believe is actually quite a very long scene and maybe not even needing that much time. The show then moves to Rand and Tam walking down the quarry road and their encounters with the Murdral. I allowed about three minutes for this scene. Then we move to Rand and Tam entering the village. They've got a few short interactions with the villagers, but the main events here are Rand meeting Matt and Perrin, the discussion of the Black Rider, and then the introduction of Tom Marilyn, Moraine, and eventually Padon Fane coming into the village on his wagon. The scene includes Padon Fane telling the town of the goings-on of the rest of the world, and eventually he tells of, of Loghain the False Dragon. This is a bunch of strung together little mini scenes, but I allotted 12 minutes for all of this. The story then pans to Loghain. We know that they are expanding his role, so again I figured this might be a good place to introduce him into the story. This scene is, I'm not necessarily writing out the plot of, I'm just simply saying that they could be introducing him here and we could see his armies. This scene could be a sex scene for all all we know and then moving on to him commanding an army we just need to introduce him as a character and as an independent character this scene i allotted three minutes for and then after this we see rand and tam settling back in at the farm and doing some chores of course this is broken by the sudden surprise of a trollic attack and tam fighting them off this scene wouldn't need to last more than three minutes now i don't know that i would include this next part in my adaptation but i decided to put this in the following scene in anyway just in case they decided to do it so now i have the story panning over to emmons field and us seeing the events of Winter Night unfolding there, and Moraine and Land defending the town. This would be another three minute action scene. We now pan back to the Althor farm, and we see Rand fleeing with a wounded Tam, running through the forest while being chased by Trollocs. This would take about another two minutes. We arrive back in Emmons Field, where the villagers are recovering from the night's attack, when Rand and Tam emerge from the Westwood. Tam is taken to the inn and healed while Rand waits for him, this entire scene takes about four minutes. Rand then falls asleep and dreams, where he's first confronted by a Shamaniel in his dreams. He wakes after a three-minute dream sequence where he's warned about trusting Aes Sedai, blah, blah, blah. The scene where it is explained to the boys that they must leave and that they decide to set out happens next. They are stopped on their way out and Maureen tells the story of Manetherin to the villagers and then they scatter and then they leave Emmons Field. This entire sequence takes about seven minutes. Now we have scenes of the party being chased through the woods of the two rivers by Trollocs, Murdral, and a Dragar. This feels like a chase scene and it's kind of horrific, and I allotted three minutes of kind of a suspenseful chase scene here. The final scene of the episode involves the party entering Tarn Ferry and crossing the Tarn, only to have Moraine sink the ferry and inadvertently kill Hightower, further adding to their mistrust of her, and of course us as the viewer not necessarily trusting her. This final scene should take about five minutes. In total, this would make the first episode leave taking 54 minutes long and end with the party out of the two rivers. Now let's get to episode two, Shadows Waiting. The episode opens up with the group camped. There's a bunch of small conversations going on among the party. The boys are discussing whether they can trust Moraine. Egwene and Moraine are talking about channeling and the nature of the one power. These character and world building sequences are gonna take about six minutes. The next scene is the road to Berlon the next morning. They ride in uh, in seeming peace and have trivial conversations that kind of establish each other's characters. Uh, I'm going to give about two minutes for that scene. We now pan to a group of Aes Sedai, including Alana, plotting to take down Loghain and fight against him. We have new characters established here, and we get to see then Loghain also preparing for another large battle scene. This entire scene of the two groups takes about four minutes. We go back to the main party as they enter Berlon. They move through the streets, and this is more just establishing shots of the location, of the people, and the businesses that are going on in the town. Uh, they head to an inn, and I'm gonna give about two minutes for all of that. Once they're in the inn, Rand and Matt take off to explore the city, and they have an encounter with the White Cloaks for the first time. And then they escape back to their inn, but not before telling Padon Fane, who they see in the street where they are staying. This scene takes about four minutes. When they return to the inn, Nynaeve is there. There are stern conversations, and then she ends up staying with them, and then they dance that night in the inn. It's a little joyous. Uh, we get to see some more world building. We get to see Moraine smiling and dancing. This entire sequence takes about six minutes. That same night, we see Loghain's capture in the night by the Aes Sedai. The struggle and eventual capture of Loghain also demonstrates his power, and then more so the power of the Aes Sedai. That entire sequence takes about four minutes. We now pan to another dream of Rand's as Ashamael is messing with his dreams again. Uh, another three minute dream sequence here. He wakes up and encounters the Murdral in the hallway. The party flees Berlon uh, in the night and they encounter White Cloaks 
folks before escaping. There's a four minute sequence. Now they're being chased through the night as they ride hard. We see small skirmishes. Moraine uses the power, but they're forced to flee to Shadar Logoth after a brief conversation. This scene takes about four minutes. We see the group enter Shadar Logoth, more of an establishing shot and kind of builds the creepiness of the place. They find a place to stay and they make a camp. Maureen tells them of the dangers of the place, and that takes about three minutes. Matt, Perrin, and Rand all sneak off and meet with Mordeth, and Matt grabs the dagger, and eventually they make it back into the camp. That whole sequence takes about five minutes. As they sleep, they discover that Trollocs again have entered the city. They flee, but they're separated by Trollocs and Mashadar. They flee in different directions, and Egwene and Perrin almost drown. In fact, the cliffhanger could be it seems like they did. And then the episode ends with Rand, Matt, and Tom boarding a boat, and then the boat sailing away before they had noticed, leaving the group completely separated. This sequence is action-packed and takes eight minutes total. So the whole fleeing from the city, getting on the boat, ending the episode, eight minutes. That puts this episode at 53 minutes long. Now we move on to episode three, A Place of Safety. This episode opens with Matt and Rand and Tom on the spray talking with Bail Domon, not being thrown overboard, uh, and establishing that they're moving fast ahead of the rest of the group. This scene takes about three minutes. We now move to Perrin and Egwene, washing up on the opposite shore, trying to strategize about what to do next. That's scene takes about two minutes. We now move to Loghain being transported towards Camelin with the Aes Sedai. Short conversations here, but again, we're just having them be a part of the story, checking in a little bit. Two minutes. We're now back on spray as they sail down the river. Rand climbs the mast, acts all crazy, starts doing backflips off the stuff, and he's all exhilarated. They talk him down. He's not feeling well. That scene takes about two minutes, again, establishing that Rand did channel. We now meet Moraine, Lan, and Nynaeve as they strategize on what to do about the missing boys. They decide that heading towards Whitebridge by horse is the best thing to do and they take off. That takes about three minutes. We are now back with Perrin and Egwene. They meet Elias Machira and the wolves. Perrin learns that he can talk to wolves. This scene takes about five minutes. Rand and Matt and Tom arrive in Whitebridge. They head to an inn. They get a bite to eat. They decide to go to Camelin. They head outside and they are immediately attacked by the Murdral. Tom is seemingly killed and then they flee Whitebridge. That whole sequence takes about five minutes. We move back to Perrin and Egwene with Elias and they meet the Tinkers. They stay with them, dance, eat, and then they seem happy. We learn a lot about the way of the leaf and then Perrin argues against it, telling them they're dumb. All that takes about five minutes. Matt and Rand stop in a town, but they're chased away by dark friends and end up sleeping in a ditch outside. This takes three minutes. The next morning, Perrin and Gwen leave the Tinkers and they start back on their own journey. As they travel, they are attacked by the Ravens. They flee and they hide near the abandoned setting. They are separated from Elias. That whole sequence takes about four minutes and is pretty suspenseful. Maureen and Lan and Nynaeve move into Whitebridge and discover what happened there some time back. They resolve to keep pushing on and find the boys that they can find. This whole scene here takes about two, two and a half minutes. Perrin and Egwene are found by White Cloaks, and then they're captured after Rand kills one of them for killing a wolf. And then they are interrogated. Perrin gets the crap beat out of him. Uh, that whole sequence takes about six minutes. Matt and Rand take shelter and play for their supper in Four Kings. They are captured and Rand channels for them to escape. They jump in the back of a cart, and the driver says he will take them to Camelin. This scene takes about six minutes. Moraine and Lan and Nynaeve rescue Perrin and Egwene after Bayer tries to get them to escape so he could kill them. They are reunited and they push towards Camelin. This scene takes about five minutes. The final scene of the episode is Rand dreaming again and waking up in the cart. He has like an Ishamael dream and then wakes up right as the cart is approaching Camelin. This scene takes about two minutes. So in total, A Place of Safety is 55 minutes long. Now we come to episode four, The Dragon Reborn. The episode opens with Rand and Matt taking a room at the Queen's Blessing. We get establishing shots of the city and Rand and Matt meeting Loyal. This scene takes about five minutes. Rand leaves to see the city uh, and then he ends up seeing Loghain as he's being marched through the city. Rand falls into the garden while watching and that whole watching thing takes about four minutes. We then pan to Pot on Fane who sees Rand fall into to the garden, but he is mumbling crazy stuff, and we can kind of really see that he's going nuts. And that scene lasts a minute, and it's just there to establish that Pot on Fane is still in the picture. We then find Rand in the garden, where he meets Elaine, Galad, Gawain, and he gets taken before the Queen, before eventually getting released. That whole sequence takes about seven minutes. We go back to the inn, where everyone is reunited. Matt is healed. They discuss the situation. It's decided that they're going to take the ways to Faldara to go to the Eye of the World. These sequences take about seven minutes. Now we see the party enter the ways with loyal guiding. It's scary and they're they're chased out. This whole sequence takes about four minutes. We again see Pot on Fane following and he's engulfed by the Black Wind. That takes a minute. Now we see the party ride into Faldara and meet with Agomar. They explain what they're about, but they're interrupted with reports of Fane scaling the walls. Moraine leaves. That scene takes about five minutes. Agomar then tells the boys and Egwene and 
Nynaeve about Malkir and the story of its fall and basically Land's history. Little world building lesson here. Moraine now returns. That whole story takes about four minutes. They depart for the Blight the next morning. They fight through the Blight, then they find the Green Man. That sequence of moving through the Blight takes about five minutes. We now have the confrontation at the Eye of the World. We meet the Green Man and then the Forsaken. Rand defeats the Forsaken and then again Ishamael and we see the Battle of Tarwin's Gap happening as well. They can get really creative about how to adapt this, but this entire ending sequence I'm allotting 15 minutes for, with it the, the episode ending with Moraine whispering that Rand is the Dragon Reborn. The episode is 58 minutes long and concludes Eye of the World. Now, I'm going to stop there. While this is certainly not, not exactly how they're going to adapt the show, this is more of a proof of concept that it could be done. I really do believe now that they could adapt all of the Eye of the World into four episodes without really losing a whole lot. This actually makes me feel quite a bit better about it, and because I, I really thought it was going to be rushed, but I don't think it'll feel that way. This obviously leaves later episodes like Blood Calls Blood to be the escape of Potan Fane and the Flame of Tarvalin as the introduction of the Amalin Sea, as well as the backstory of Moraine and Swan in the New Spring content. I I don't think we're going to see the first season end with Falma, so I don't think we're going to see two books in one season, but I do think we might end with Egwene's kidnapping by Leandrin and Rand and Loyal and Huron disappearing by Portalstone. In any case, all of this is simply speculation, but that's the Wheel of Time news, and there's a ton of it. Let me know what you guys think of all of this in the comments below. What do you think of the casting? How do you feel about the Eye of the World being condensed into four episodes, if that's what they end up doing? Also, please like the video and subscribe to the channel to see more Wheel of Time news and lore content. If you want to support what I do here, buy some merch or check out the Patreon. Uh, both links are in the description below. Thanks everybody for watching and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. Mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free crying. Tinker, oh dear, Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?